position of the communist in relation to the various existing opposition parties. Okay, so this is the final section and It's not too long here, so let's finish this off. Uh, the communists fight for the attainment of the immediate aims for the enforcement of the monetary interest of the working class. But in the movement of the present, they also represent and take care of the future of that movement. In France, the communists ally themselves with the social democrats against the conservative and radical bourgeoisie, reserving, however, the right to take up a critical position in regard to phrases and illusions traditionally handed down from the Great Revolt Revolution. Okay, so social democrats are like bourgeois liberals. Um, social democrats in France at this time and even to this day are much more socialistic than the Democratic Party in the United States. The Democratic Party is relatively a reactionary uh, party uh, compared to uh, social democrats in Europe. <clears throat> but uh, communists can make alliances with liberal bourgeoisie where it's uh, tactically or strategically uh, advantageous in their estimation. But as conditions change, then, you know, that those alliances may fade away. In Switzerland, they support the radicals without losing sight of the fact that this party consists of antagonistic elements, partly of democrat socialist in the French sense, partly of radical bourgeois. In Poland, they support the party that insists on an agrarian revolution as the prime condition for national emancipation, that party which form, fomented the insurrection of Krakow in 1846. In Germany, they fight with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way against the absolute monarchy, the feudal squirearchy, and the petty bourgeoisie. But, in, they, but they never cease for a single instant to instill into the working class the clearest possible recognition of the hostile antagonism between bourgeoisie and proletariat in order that the German workers may straightaway use as so many weapons against the bourgeoisie the social and political conditions that the bourgeoisie must necessarily introduce along with its supremacy and in order that after the fall of the reactionary class in Germany, the fight against the bourgeoisie itself may immediately begin. Okay. Um, so communists may make alliances even with reactionary forces like the petty bourgeoisie and petty bourgeois socialism, but communists keep haranguing about the big class struggle, that between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Uh, so that once, once uh, the utility of the petty bourgeois have, has uh, uh, come to an end in getting rid of the vestiges of feudalism, the proletariat can move on to attack the bourgeoisie. Okay. The communists turn their attention chiefly to Germany because that country is on the eve of a bourgeois revolution that is bound to be carried out under more advanced conditions of European civilization and with a much more developed proletariat than that of England was in the 17th and of France in the 18th century. And because the bourgeois revolution in Germany will be but the prelude to an immediately following proletarian revolution. Okay, notice that they speak of the English Revolution, bourgeois revolution being in the 17th century, that's the 1600s, and that's the way I presented it. Uh, and then in France in the 18th century, starting in 1789, uh, and I, I gave you some historical uh, background of that, but you know, as I suggested, I think the, the bourgeois revolution is still on, underway in France at this moment, but in Germany, the bourgeois revolution is still struggling against an entrenched uh, monarchy. Okay, so, um, so these different countries are at different stages in the historical development 
but Marx and Engels see this kind of historical determinism uh, that is driving everybody in the same direction. Uh, which, you know, largely panned out, but not nearly as quickly as, as they, as they uh, imagined the proletariat uh, revolution to come. The bourgeois revolution, they were pretty accurate on. The proletariat revolution, not so accurate on. In short, the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things, whatever that may be. In all these movements, they bring to the front as the leading question in each, the property question no matter what its degree of development at that time. Finally, they labor everywhere for the union and agreement of the democratic parties of all countries. Well, let's get democracy in place. The communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. You're gonna say it plainly. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries unite. Okay, so there's their propagandistic uh, ending. Um, In, in, you know, in, in the face of the ecological cataclysm, we're facing a moment very much like this. The, the vast majority of people um, have nothing to lose with a society that's heading towards suicide. Uh, if we get too deep into this ecological cataclysm, there's going to be no stopping it. Um, and so there really is there's nothing to lose. There, there's the the future is being foreclosed on uh, our contemporary, you know, uh, form of society, whatever we might call it. I mean, we've almost gone beyond capitalism, uh, or maybe we have, but that analysis is not clear. It's hard to describe. Uh, in these traditional terms, exactly what the structure of our society is. Um, but, but we know that we're on, uh, we're undermining the very existence of humans uh, through the societal structures that we have. And to think that you can survive without the ecology is a pure fantasy. Now, say maybe some rich people could live some kind of weird existence, holed up in some kind of weird, hermetically sealed uh, buildings or underground, or I don't know what they're thinking, uh, their bunkers. Um, but uh, for most people, that's a that's a fantasy. You just you don't have enough money. You'll never have enough money. It's going to be a small fraction of the population that can really protect themselves from the horrendous ecological conditions. Everybody else is going to have to suffer, and, and many of them die. Billions of people dying within a short amount of time, uh, including Americans, including U.S. citizens. Just being a U.S. citizen does not protect you. You're so far away, unless you happen to be one of these rich people, as some students claim to be. but most people have to work, and if you have to work, you know, what happens when there's no more work? What happens when something bigger than COVID hits? <clears throat> um, so, uh, something to think about in relationship to the ecological cataclysm is what do you have to lose? All right, uh, I will leave it at that.